Anyone? Some of you might be wondering, what is Google Maps? I don't know, but <laughs> nowadays it seems that if, if you want to go anywhere you haven't been before, or, or maybe even somewhere you have been before, but you want to get there in the fastest possible time, as we often do, you just plug it into Google Maps, or maybe into your Navman or Garmin or whatever other uh, device you use, and you find your way there. But who can remember the time before Google Maps when you used real maps? You know, like the Melways, some of the young people are thinking, what's he talking about? Or uh, Vic Roads, if you wanted to go outside of Melbourne. Um, or even, you remember those paper maps that you'd unfold and then try and put back together and they never went back the same way. But of course, if you were making your way to some distant town to which you were not sure of the way, or, uh, there was another navigational tool that was also available to you. Signposts. <laughs> Just simple old signposts. In an age of Google Maps, signposts are still in use today. They help you to find maybe a town you haven't been to before, the public toilets, uh, a car park if you need one, even a church. Sometimes when going off to a, uh, a far off destination, you might actually need multiple signs to help you find your way there. During uh, my childhood, uh, I remember every summer holidays, we used to head off to Marimbula on the south coast of New South Wales. And as a young boy, it was like paradise to me. For three or sometimes four weeks, every January, the sun, the coast, caravanning with the cousins, beach in the morning, fishing in the afternoon and evening, banana sandwiches on fresh white bread for lunch, prawns on the barbecue, what could be better? than this. It was the highlight of my year. But I still remember the journey in our caravan. Marimbula was a long way from our home in South Gippsland. It was about 500 kilometres and I remember with anticipation every year looking out the window of the car following the signposts. First we'd follow the, the signs to, to sail in East Gippsland. Then Lakes Entrance, Orbost and Can River. We'd cross the border just after Genoa and then we'd strike the first signpost to our destination, Marimbula, 74 kilometres or whatever the distance was and the excitement would build. Signposts, even in a day of Google Maps, can help us find our way to a destination. Well, the story that Pam read to us uh, at the end of John 4 functions in this kind of way in the book of John. You might be, remember that the destination John wants for us, his readers, to arrive at is that we might arrive at faith in Jesus Christ. John chapter 20 verse 31 functions as a purpose statement in the book of John where it says, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. This is the purpose of John's gospel. John wants us to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, so that we might have life in all its fullness in relationship with him. And the first part of the book is carefully assembled with stories or signposts pointing to this conclusion. In fact, some theologians have called John chapters 1 through to chapter 12 uh, the book of signs, identifying seven miracles or signs pointing to, to Jesus as the Son of God. 
while the healing of the official son is the second of these signs in John. You might have noticed that in verse 54, it it said right at the end, this was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed having come from Judea to Galilee. Incidentally, can anyone remember the first sign? And there is a prize. Oh, the hands go up. So, uh, uh, Fern was first. Ah, the wine. Perfect. You've got it in one. Oh, there. I get to keep the rest. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Well done, Fern. Yes, so... um, It was when Jesus turned the water into wine at Cana at the wedding celebration, you remember. It's listed there as the first sign back in chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Well, starting at verse 46. Once more, he, that's Jesus, visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. So John reminds us of that first sign. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. So here's the scenario. Jesus uh, is visiting Cana again in Galilee. Now he's become known as a miracle worker and a prophet. Many of the Galilean locals who were there had followed him to Jerusalem and seen his miracles and healings. And of course, in this very town, Cana, he turned the water into wine at the wedding. And probably many of those who were there at this point had been there at that wedding. So there's Jesus, the miracle worker. And then there's there's this man, a royal official, whose son lies sick in Capernaum. Now Capernaum is also in Galilee. Uh, I Google mapped it, (laughs) and it's about 40 kilometres from Cana, so a fair distance away. And we know from the next verse that the man's son is close to death. Now, put yourself in this scenario. I wonder what you'd do. You've got a child at home who who is close to death. And then a proven miracle worker arrives in your district at this very time. What are you going to do? Well, the royal official does what every loving parent would do. He goes to Jesus and he begs Jesus to come and to heal his son. So what is Jesus' response? Verse 48. He says to the man, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. Now, I don't know about you, but at first glance, that seems like a fairly cold uh, and insensitive response by Jesus. I mean, this man's son is close to death. It's not not quite what we might expect and probably not the encouragement that this man was hoping for. But of course, Jesus and John, who recorded this story, included this phrase for a much wider audience than just this man, including us here today. And I want to return to this verse in a moment because it's a key part of this story and becomes an important theme throughout the book of John. But back to the story. The man, undeterred by Jesus' statement, begs, Sir, come down before my child dies. So there's real desperation here. I mean, there's a a fair bit at stake for this man. And he's not going to be put off from his best chance to save his son. Now, I think I can relate to this man's desperation, at least... To, to some extent. Um, just six weeks ago, our Jesse uh, was playing football at Maryborough and he got what was we thought was just a, a fairly normal corked thigh um, in a collision and he played out the game or nearly played out the game. Um, I stood up afterwards, did all the normal things and we started to head back from Maryborough to Kyneton. We got to about Castlemaine and he said, 
this is getting really sore. And uh, just a few minutes later, Susie and I looked at each other and we thought, we're going to take him to emergency. He was in a lot of pain. And being a former physiotherapist and Susie being a physiotherapist, you know, you start to uh, map out all the scenarios and we're thinking, oh, this could be compartment syndrome where it swells up and can begin to cut off circulation. Well, we got to uh, the ED at Kyneton. Um, I ran in for a wheelchair. We put Jesse in the wheelchair and started to go in. I felt his thigh, and I don't know if you've ever held a full watermelon in your hands. You know, that, how that firm, that's how his leg felt. And I'm starting to panic a bit. I'm met at the door by the admission officer, and she says to me, what are you doing here? Why didn't you take him to Bendigo? Why didn't you call an ambulance? Well, my response wasn't quite as desperate as the royal official, but I was a little bit surprised at, at what came out of my mouth the next moment. I said to her, that's not important. We're here now. It's an emergency situation. Get on with it. <laughs> Long story short, uh, Jesse was rushed to Royal Melbourne Hospital uh, in an ambulance, two green whistles, 20 milligrams of morphine. Uh, I, th I really thought we were heading for surgery. I was praying and praying in the ambulance that the bleeding would stop. And, well, they managed to watch him overnight. And um, his circulation to his foot was never completely cut off. And, and uh, we were able to pick him up and take him home the next day. So we, we thank God for that. But back to the story. Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus responds, you may go. Your son will live. The man takes Jesus at his word. He leaves for home. But while he is still on the way, some of his servants come up from Capernaum. They meet him on the way with the news that his boy is living. And when he inquires as to the time at which the fever left his son, he says it left him at the seventh hour, which is one o'clock. And the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And so he and all his household believed. Now, we're not told exactly what they believed, but the assumption is that they come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Remember John 20, 31, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. But let's go back to verse 48 for a minute. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. And I want to explore for a few moments the relationship between signs and faith because it's a central part of this passage. What is the relationship between signs and faith or belief? What is the relationship between seeing the works of God and believing he is who he says he is? You know, I reckon there are two mistakes we can make when it comes to signs or miracles and faith. The first is what I'm going to call sign fixation. See, what Jesus is naming here in this verse is an unquenched and unending appetite for miracles. The desire for one more miracle, one more proof before we'll take the plunge and trust in Jesus. And maybe you know people like that. You might remember um, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. It's actually a few chapters on in John, but I did speak about it a few weeks back where Jesus, with the, the five loaves and two fish, uh, feeds this multitude of people. You know, an amazing miracle. 
But then in the discussion that follows with this same very crowd of people who have just eaten all this food, as Jesus claims to be the bread of life, they say to him, what miraculous sign will you give us that we may see it and believe you? (laughs) Our forefathers ate manna in the desert. He, that's Moses, gave them bread to eat. So they've seen the sign and then they want it again. Or then there's Thomas, after the resurrection of Jesus, where he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. And Jesus responds, because you have seen me, Thomas, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know, at its worst, this kind of fixation on signs can lead to an infatuation with miracles or signs that never actually leads to the destination to which the signs are pointing, a deep abiding trust in Jesus. We can become sign dependent, refusing to trust in Jesus, requiring one more sign, one more fleece, but never arriving at the destination of faith. Now, don't get me wrong, miracles are important. We should live in expectation that God can break in at any moment. We should pray for healing when someone is sick, believing that God can, if it's his will, bring healing. But the climax of this story here, and this is really important, the climax of this story is not when the man's son is healed. The climax of this story is when this royal official and all of his household believe. Now there's an important progression in this man coming to this place of faith in Jesus and it's found There in verse 50. You see, Jesus actually only gives this man half of what he asked for. Did you notice that? Verse 47, the man begs Jesus to come and to heal his son. Again in verse 49, he says, come down before my son dies. But Jesus doesn't go. He just responds, you may go, your son will live. Now I've got a confession to make. You're all listening now, aren't you? (laughs) I'm not actually at my best when I'm on the phone to customer service. (laughs) No, actually it is something I'm trying to get better at (laughs) because... I can lose it a bit. But when I think of this man and Jesus' response, you may go, your son will live, I wonder how I would have responded. Because there's so much trust required here. It reminds me when you've been on hold to customer service for like one hour, you finally get through to someone, And after talking for a few minutes, you hear the dreaded words, let me just put you on hold for a moment while I put you through to a department that can help you. And it's like, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Don't put me on hold. You don't know how long you're going to be on hold for. You don't know if you'll actually get through. You don't know if you're going to get disconnected. You finally got through to a real person. You don't want to go on hold. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for this man? He's got Jesus right there with him. And Jesus says, you may go. Your son will live. How much trust must it have taken to walk away from the man who could heal his son? Well, verse 50 tells us that the man took Jesus at his word. And believed. 
Now, I'm not going to lie, it can be hard to trust Jesus when you're in a pressure situation. Someone close to you is critically ill. You've lost your job and bills are piling up. You wake up and everything feels dark. And you just don't know how you're going to get through. And we can be tempted to wonder, is God real? Does he care? And some of you might be in that place right now. Is there a sense that you need to take Jesus at his word and believe what he has said today? Are there some promises that you need to hold on to? like you are forgiven. I am with you always. I will provide for you. I'm not done with you yet. How might you, like this royal official, take Jesus at his word today without the need for another sign and trust in him to come through for you? The second mistake we can make when it comes to signs and faith is what I'm going to call sign blindness. You see, despite the possibility of getting overly fixated on signs, we shouldn't disregard them either. Signs have an important role to play in the book of John and in the ministry of Jesus. And we mustn't be blind to the work of God around us. We need to foster attentiveness to the work of God in our experience every day. You see, God is at work all around us every day. Sometimes it is our familiarity with the work of God that can lead to us taking it for granted. I remember... Uh, 21 years ago, we were living in uh, Launceston, Tasmania, uh, and we'd been out, Susie and I, and at that point we had Matilda. She was uh, one year old. We'd been out for the evening at some meeting, and we came home, and it was pitch black, dark. I go around to the back of the house. I'm holding Matilda in one one hand and I'm fumbling for my keys with the other and trying to get in the back door just under. And she says, Dad, look. Maybe she was two. (laughs) Or nearly two. She said, Dad, look. And I thought, she's pointing up and I thought, oh, maybe there's a possum up there in the eaves or something. And I look and and then I realised she'd just seen the stars. And... It had just captured her. I think it was Rolf Emerson who said, if the stars came out just once in a thousand years, how many would look up into the sky and exclaim, surely there must be a God. We are surrounded by the work of God, yet can be blind to the very things that might strengthen our faith. I've heard it said that miracles are everyday occurrences that faith sees as a mighty work of God. Like a sunrise. Like the birth of a baby. Like a chance encounter with someone at just the right time. Like rain in season. Faith makes us attentive to the work of God around us every day. At other times, God might break through in special ways. I'd call them God moments that lead us to faith or deeper levels of trust. And we need to mark these moments in our lives. In the Old Testament, the people of God would build uh, pillars of stone to mark moments when, when God had shown his power, like when he parted or dried up the seas of the Jordan so the people could go into the promised land. 
And these pillars would help the people to remember what God had done and to pass these stories on to future generations. One moment or signpost that serves as something of a pillar of God's faithfulness in my life happened just towards the conclusion of my time here as pastor at Kyneton Baptist Church. And it's something that I regularly hold on to when I consider God's call for us into cross-cultural ministry. Some of you will be aware of our, our growing connection with cross-cultural mission during our time here at Kyneton Baptist Church. It was, it was really through Kyneton Baptist Church that we connected with the work in South Asia. What most of you won't know was that some two years before I finished here as pastor, I had seriously considered leaving the church to fill the state director role with Baptist Mission Australia, then Global Interaction. I did two years later, but that's, that comes later. <laughs> anyway, at this time, I was really interested in the role. I applied for it, was practically told it was mine, but I felt uneasy. Something told me my time at Kyneton Baptist Church was not finished, so I withdrew my application, which was really hard. Well, the next two years here became really hard for me, really hard for us. I experienced anxiety, depression, burnout. I started to question lots of things. I'll, I'll spare you all the detail, but it was a really difficult time for us. I reckon I experienced what many have called a dark night of the soul. Well, long story short, just to buy time, we went on long service leave and took a trip around Tasmania with the kids. And I thought I was done with ministry. I, I really thought I was done. I was wondering what I was going to do. So, you know, I'm too old to dig. <laughs> what am I going to do with my life? Well, about three weeks into that trip, we pulled into a little place just south of Hobart called Snug. Anyone heard of Snug? I've got some Tasmanian friends here. I know that they have. Beautiful little town, just about 20 minutes south of Hobart. And we pulled in there with our camper trailer and we got this spot. It was just amazing. Right, like from here to the baptistry up the back, away from the edge of the water. Just beautiful. And we loved it so much that we stayed for six days. We weren't planning to stay that long. Anyway, after you've been camping for a while, you take these moments to do the washing. <laughs> so we were in the laundry one day, Susan and I, and we've put, the, we've put the clothes in the washing and they're churning away and we're waiting for it. I sit down and we're flicking through just some magazines, you know, that are there beside um, the washing machine. And as we're flicking through, I pull out one of these. Now, that's a Baptist Mission Australia guide. Um, this is the two, 2022 one. And I'm flicking through it, looking at the pictures of the people uh, that are serving in mission. I start to say to Suze, I wonder why God didn't see fit two years ago that I take on this role back then. Now, um, it's not always healthy to do that, but we had quite a conversation. Well, it would have been perfect, you know? Why? Why? Anyway, we finished our washing. Within the next week, I got a text message from the then state director saying, Ryan... Um, I don't know if you've heard, but the state director position is available again. I'm wondering if the timing might, better, but not, might be better for you now. We just looked at each other and we just knew that this was a God moment. I didn't feel like it. I was still burned out, but we just knew that this was a God moment and God was calling me back into that work. Now, I don't know who put one of these amongst the trashy magazines in the caravan park. It just seems the most 
unbelievable thing. But I know God was in it. And when I think of our current call to service in South Asia, I often come back to that moment. Signposts. God moments. We need to mark these moments in our lives and remember them. I have many now in my life. When I came to faith, my call to ministry, my, my, our, our call to Kyneton Baptist Church, our call to other ministry situations, moments when God spoke to me like the one I've just mentioned and they serve as faith builders when times get a bit tough. I wonder, is there a signpost or God moment in your life that you need to remember today. That you need to go back to. Camp out at for a while and give thanks to God. Are there times in your life that you need to look back on that your faith might be built up? You know, for this royal official... This healing of his son was one of those moments. And I bet for this family, they never forgot this time. And no doubt they returned to it in their memory right throughout their lives. Do you remember the time when Jesus healed our son? It was a sign that led them to faith in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. And John records it as a sign for us too. That we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, we might have life in his name. Well, as we continue through John in the coming weeks, there'll be more signs. Remember, there are seven in this first 12 chapters, so far we've seen just two. But from here on in, John doesn't actually identify the signs as we come to them. We need to look for them ourselves. But just in conclusion, I wonder, where are you at in your faith today? And what part do signposts play in your life and faith? Are you one who is slow to believe, who always needs proof or one more sign that God is at work? Is there a way in which you need to take Jesus at his word today and act on it? Is there a promise that you need to hold on to today? Or secondly, can you be a little blind to the work of God in and around your life? Is there a God moment that you need to return to today? What signposts do you see before you? And are you following them to the one who brings true life? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are present everywhere around us. We thank you that the very world is sustained by your life and your breath. Forgive us when we just take that for granted. And we thank you, Lord, that you have broken into our world in special ways. We think most uh, vividly of you coming as a human being, Lord Jesus, for showing us how to live and for giving your life uh, for the sin of the world and rising again, Lord, to overcome 
uh, the evil one and to bring us new life. And Lord, we thank you for sending your spirit and we thank you that your spirit, Lord, is at work all around us. Lord, help us to see you. Help us to be attentive to the ways in which you make yourself known to us. Yet, Lord, help us not to be ones who are just always looking for signs and not actually believing what you say. Help us to follow what we see of you in our world to you, that we might truly believe and hold firm to you who is the Messiah, the Son of God. And help us, Lord, to be those who share your hope with others in our world. We ask your help for us in this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.